Welcome to a virtual visit of the house of Cacilius Jucundus. We're standing on Vesuvius Street, one of the main streets in this ancient city, and are looking at the main entrance of the house. As was usual in Pompeii, there are shops on either side of the entrance to this big house. This impressive entrance is crowned by a beautifully made frieze, which gave it even more status. This mosaic on the floor tells you that there was a watchdog on the premises, even if this Fido doesn't look particularly fierce. Behind the mosaic, the corridor opens into one of the most important rooms in the house, the atrium. The atrium was the heart of the Roman house, the natural meeting place for daily activities and receiving guests, and the centre for communication. There were smaller rooms along the long sides, preferably laid out symmetrically, like here. The rooms towards the front were possibly bedrooms. The two in the back were more open. They were called wings. The reconstruction shows how the atrium might have looked somewhere around that fateful late summer day in AD 79. The large dimensions, the rich colours and the contrast in the decorations made the atrium a suitable place to receive and impress visitors. In the mornings, people who were dependent, socially, economically or in some other way on the master of the house, paid their respects by joining in a ceremony in the atrium. In our case, it is Cacilius Jucundus who receives us. This portrait was found during excavations in the 1870s. That the atrium was used as a kind of state room is also clear from the fact that the house's treasure chest was placed here, as well as the house altar. Putting it near the entrance demonstrated the family's piety and wealth. An altar in a house was dedicated primarily to the house gods, the Lares. The altar in our house was very lavish. On the platform was a carved frieze with an unusual and gripping motif. It shows the damaged large temple of the Roman gods Jupiter, Juno and Minerva in the Forum in Pompeii, as it looked after the earthquake which shook the city in AD 63, less than 20 years before the volcano erupted. The temple, like the equestrian statues in front of it, leans precariously. The altar was put up probably in gratitude for having survived the catastrophe. No one knew then that it foretold an ever worse one. Thanks to an ingenious architectural solution, a roof sloping down towards an opening in the centre of the room, the atrium could ensure important daily needs like light and water. Through these tall doors, light flowed into the smaller, windowless side rooms around the atrium. Through the opening in the roof, the house could also collect rainwater. It was collected in the pool under it, and was then led to a large underground cistern. In Jucundus' time, this function wasn't as important, as the house was connected to the communal water network and the aqueduct, fed by mountain springs. The smaller rooms are also finely decorated, Sometimes, like here, the colour scheme is calm, perhaps more suitable for a bedroom. In Roman decorative painting, the wall was divided into zones and panels. The geometric style on the top of the wall here is very old-fashioned, like the house itself, about 200 years old when the volcano erupted. The rest of the decorations were renewed in Jucundus's time, some decades before the catastrophe. When we continue past the atrium, we come to the house's finest room, the tablinum. We will pass through it on our way to the gardens. In antiquity, this way wasn't open for the majority of guests here, or even the household. They used the corridor outside instead. The tablinum was the special domain of the master of the house. The walls are richly decorated here, with paintings of the highest quality. Pictures with mythological beings and scenes from the theatre world are presented within richly decorated frames. The wall paintings are still relatively well preserved. The fact that several sections in the middle zone are missing is because they were cut out and put into museums. During the excavations in the 18th and 19th centuries, it was normal to treat ancient wall decoration like this and frame them like paintings. 
Today, it is common to try to keep and maintain them in place. All of the paintings that were cut from Cachelius Eucundus' tablinum walls are now seen here. We're now entering the garden, the peristyle. The word comes from the Greek and means something surrounded by columns. In this case, the cultivated gardens in the middle. Only two sides of Eucundus' gardens had colonnades. On the third side, there was a series of rooms with large openings facing instead towards the gardens. On the fourth side was the tall, richly decorated wall marking the boundary between Eucundus' property and his neighbours. Between mock columns, there were paintings of gardens and scenes of hunting and sea battles, all eroded away today. In this part of the peristyle, the 19th century excavators made a unique find. Cachelius Eucundus's business archives, more than 150 wax tablets. Together with his portrait, they have made Eucundus the most famous Pompeii resident. These documents allow in-depth studies into the world of Pompeian daily business life and its organisation. The decorations here in the house's large dining room are better preserved than in the gardens because people realised the importance of roofing the room to protect the painted walls very soon after excavating them. The dining room was large enough to hold even more people than the traditional maximum for Roman banquets, which was nine. The guests reclined on couches. On the walls there were motifs from well-known myths, like the one here about Paris, soon to announce the winner of the competition between three goddesses to determine the most beautiful. As we all know, Venus won with fateful consequences. Venus was very popular in Pompeii. Her power was also honoured in a more informal message. At a level just above the dining couches, someone carved the following three lines of verse into the wall plaster. Visa mat valiat periat qui nescit amare, bis tanto periat qui squis amare vetat. He who loves should live. He who knows not how to love should die, and he who obstructs love should die twice. If you look out into the gardens from the place of honour, you will see that the view is enhanced by waterworks, for example, a high-stemmed marble vase in the shape of a shell, from which a little spring issues forth. There were undoubtedly more fountains behind it. To reconstruct now lost wall decorations, like the one we see here on the far garden wall, you have to search in older documents, like photographs, watercolour paintings and excavation reports. One important source of information is the model of the excavation area in a 1 to 100 scale that was made in the 19th century and is now in the museum in Naples. In this case, it has given us the correct colour and the painted columns. On hot summer days and evenings, the ancients could stroll around in the shady colonnades, enjoying the sweet fragrance of the flowers and shrubs and the murmur of the fountains. The gardens themselves were mostly to look at, not so much to be in. A low wall prevented entry from the colonnade. One entered through an opening in front of the tablinum. In front of the middle garden, there was a structure whose roof rested on two red columns. This temple-like garden entrance was clearly meant to catch the eye. At the end of the colonnade, there's a flight of stairs down to a cellar. A door to the left leads to the kitchen in the neighbouring house that was incorporated into the main house. And a door to the right leads to a suite of garden rooms. These three rooms were undoubtedly planned for recreation. The wall paintings can be credibly reconstructed. On either side of the tablinum, there are two more rooms that could well have served as lounges or reception rooms for smaller banquets and dinner parties. What we've seen so far is only half of the house. To the north was the neighbouring house Eucundus brought up. It was joined onto the house we just visited by three passages. In the northern house there was a kitchen, a latrine, a stable, an open courtyard and an atrium with small rooms and a dining room. 
Both the houses had upper stories that were almost completely destroyed by the pyroclastic flow during the volcanic eruption of AD 79. How many people lived here once, family, servants and slaves, is impossible to know. They were undoubtedly numerous. We now end our visit to Cacilius Jucundus's stately house. We hope you got a good idea of how it looks today and how it most likely looked in his time, less than a generation before the catastrophe of AD 79. Welcome to a virtual visit of the house of Cacilius Jucundus. We're standing on Vesuvius Street, one of the main streets in this ancient city, and are looking at the main entrance of the house. As was usual in Pompeii, there are shops on either side of the entrance to this big house. This impressive entrance is crowned by a beautifully made frieze, which gave it even more status. There were smaller rooms along the long sides, preferably laid out symmetrically, like here. The rooms towards the front were possibly bedrooms. The two in the back were more open. They were called wings. The reconstruction shows how the atrium might have looked somewhere around that fateful late summer day in AD 79. The large this mosaic on the floor tells you that there was a watchdog on the premises even if this Fido doesn't look particularly fierce. Behind the mosaic, the corridor opens into one of the most important rooms in the house, the atrium. The atrium was the heart of the Roman house, the natural meeting place for daily activities and receiving guests, and the centre for communication. The dimensions, the rich colours, and the contrast in the decorations made the atrium a suitable place to receive and impress visitors. In the mornings, people who were dependent, socially, economically, or in some other way on the master of the house, paid their respects by joining in a ceremony in the atrium. In our case, it is Cacilius Jucundus who receives us. This portrait was found during excavations in the 1870s. That the atrium was used as a kind of state room is also clear from the fact that the house's treasure chest was placed here, as well as the house altar. Putting it near the entrance demonstrated the family's piety and wealth. An altar in a house was dedicated primarily to the house gods, the Lares. The altar in our house was very lavish. On the platform 